so I think um, we can start. Um, welcome everyone who's joining us. I, I see that you're still coming in, um, but that's obviously no, no, no problem. Um, welcome, I'm, I'm Nina Bernarding. I'm the co-founder and the co-executive director of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. We are a research advocacy and consulting organization promoting a feminist approach to foreign and security policy. I'm very thrilled today to welcome you to today's event, the European arms trade is a feminist issue and what we can do about it, which we are organizing together with the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And I would just like to take this opportunity in the beginning of this event to thank the Heinrich Böll Foundation, but in particular Giorgio and uh, Milena for what has been now a two year, very constructive and trusting relationship, which we value a lot and we're looking forward to continue it over the next years. Um, the EU member states are second only to the US in the volume of the arms that they export. And the production and export of military equipment is closely linked to what academics have called the normalization of a militarized approach to security and the pro-defense industry approach the EU Commission has been taking. At the same time, the EU continues to confirm its commitment to foster gender equality through its foreign policy, as for example, outlined in the strategic approach on women, peace and security in 2018. We at the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy believe that these two approaches do not go together. Um, and indeed, we would argue that delinking these issues fail to acknowledge that the international arms trade is a feminist issue. For these reasons, we are really thrilled that you're joining us today. Um, and over the course of the next 90 minutes, we aim to provide a brief overview of the current debates about the EU arms export policy from a gender sensitive human rights perspective and discuss how we can render the EU arms export control system a bit more gender sensitive. But before we start the discussion, I would like to hand over to Giorgio Franceschini, who is the head of Foreign and Security Policy Division at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, for some welcoming remarks. Giorgio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nina, and a very warm welcome to all of you um, to this event. I'm very happy we can co-host it with the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. As Nina said, I'm the head of the uh, Foreign and Security Policy Division, and usually I deal with the first part of the topic today, which is the weapon part, uh, arms trade, arms control, non-proliferation, disarmament. Um, I do so because disarmament is one of the pillars of the Green Party, which uh, we are, by the way, the Green Foundation. We are close to the Green Party. Uh, but another pillar of the Green Party, cultural pillar, is feminism and gender issues, which sincerely um, was a, a topic I did not work uh, very lot upon in uh, recent years. Um, this, the same holds for many of my colleagues who deal, say, with trade policy, environmental policy, um, or agricultural policy, and so forth. But in our foundation now, we have a philosophy that we want to look with a so-called gender lens to any policy field, be it agriculture, trade, foreign security policy, and so forth. And therefore, I was very happy when Nina approached us and said, look, um, we are, we'd like to tackle the issue of uh, arms trade and export controls from a feminist lens. And um, I was very happy to take this on, first of all, because um, I myself can learn a lot. And I think it's highly topical to do so. Um, it's, it, there are many reasons. Uh, and the main one will be discussed today. We have an relatively new arms trade treaty um, and, and there is an article, the article 7.4, who speaks ex explicitly about gender-based violence as a criterion which should always be assessed before, uh, um, before an, an arms export uh, is done, should be assessed in the recipient country. Um, and the other um, reason is, of course, that our impression is that the whole EU arms export policy is in flux. I mean, Hannah Neumann is very engaged on this issue. And there is now, we think, a, a window of opportunity to engage new, to, to insert new ideas and to engage new stakeholders. And uh, therefore, we're here. Um, from, as a person who dealt mainly, as I said, with the first part uh, of our topic, which is the export control, arms control part, uh, I know that this dialogue we are having today is a challenge to all of us, to all of our listeners. It's a challenge because also we are using a bit of a different jargon in, in both camps, say the classical disarmament camp and the um, uh, feminism camp. But um, we, I think we can all benefit from this discussion. People who deal with export controls usually use 
quite a legalistic language of EU common positions and arms trade treaties and all the national implementations. Feminism is more rooted in, um, in, in social movements, but we think we are convinced that the, the uh, discussion between these two camps is fruitful. Uh, uh, it has to take place now. And so this is the time and this is the place. And therefore I'm very happy that we can co-host this event uh, with the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. Thank you, Nina, and I think the floor is yours and you will introduce now our panelists. Thank you, Giorgio. Yeah, and indeed, I think, uh, thank you for pointing out the different jargons in the language, and I think this will also become um, apparent in our discussion later on. Um, yes, and before we start, I just want to say a couple of things about housekeeping rules. I won't say anything about the Zoom because I feel by now everyone is familiar with it, but I do want to um, say that this um, event today is public and that it will be recorded and we will publish the recording later on our website and our social media posts uh, websites. Um, and our agenda today looks as following. We will now have a 40 minute panel discussion with our amazing panelists and then we'll go uh, open the floor for Q&A and Giorgio will kindly moderate the Q&A session. You can either raise your hand, you have the blue hand on the bottom, or you can also just uh, post the question in the chat and then we'll um, respond to them. And now I have the, the great honor to introduce our amazing uh, panelists today. Um, I, I will start with Dr. Hannah Neumann. She's the, the member of the European Parliament for the Greens and the European Free Alliance. She's the Peace and Human Rights Coordinator for the Greens, Vice Chair of the Human Rights Committee and member of the Committees on Foreign Affairs and Security and Defense Policy and chair of the delegation for relations to the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and this year, um, the European, European Parliament adopted two of the reports that you introduced, um, one on the arms exports, which we'll also talk about later, but also one on feminist foreign policy, which obviously we were really um, excited about. So um, thank you for being here with us today. Um, we also have Verity Coyle with us. Um, she's a senior advisor and non-resident fellow with the Stimson's Conventional Defense Program. And she was most recently the coordinator of the ATT Monitor and the ATT Monitor, the Arms Trade Treaty Monitor, a civil society based global resource that provides independent analysis and information on the effectiveness of the Arms Trade Treaty um, and supports the implementation of it. Um, Verity has developed comprehensive training materials on the ATT implementation, in particular with regard to gender based violence. And uh, throughout the negotiations for the Arms Trade Treaty, um, she, was, um, the, she was part of the military security and human rights team at Amnesty International. We're really thrilled that you're here. Thank you for taking the time, Verity. Um, and our third panelist today is Dr. Hannah Muenhof. She is an assistant professor at European, of European Studies with a focus on Europe and the world at the Department of European Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Her research focuses on the European Union's external relations from a feminist perspective focusing on the EU's women's and the LGBTQI rights promotion in Turkey and the EU security and defense policy. And then we at the center, we published um, also a study which was commissioned by, by Hannah and her uh, colleague Anna Sotason earlier this year and also our research draw a lot on the research that Hannah has been providing. So we're really excited that you're here today. Um, now let's get started. And I would like to start with Verity. Um, in, in 2008, in the European EU common position, the EU defined for the first time common regulations for when to deny or grant arms exports. And last year in 2019, this EU common position, as it's called, was, was, it was updated. Um, um, and back then you were working for the NGO arms control, um, which was also crucial in actually having, this, having the arms trade treaty adopted, which is the first international treaty which regulates conventional arms. Uh, the, the trade of conventional arms. Um, and you have also been um, following, obviously, and advising from a civil society perspective, the update of the EU common position last year. So would you, would you be willing to give us a bit of an overview from a gender sensitive human rights perspective? Um, how did this update go? What is missing? Which issues have been addressed? Um, which haven't? That would be wonderful. Thank you, Nina, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's really exciting to be here with my fellow panelists. I think I've come across your work and our, our paths have crossed, but we haven't shared a platform before, so I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Um, I think it's, it's worth starting off by saying that the decision to work towards an agreement for a common regime was born in the 1990s. And ironically, some would say that uh, it was the problem of arms exports to the Middle East that was one of the main motivating factors behind that decision. 
when the opportunity to review the EU composition came around, civil society viewed it as a pretty straightforward and simple task to update from a gender sensitive human rights perspective not least because new international obligations had been created that were extremely relevant to this process. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the arms trade treaty here because I believe it is relevant to your question about the update of the EU composition. Um, and yes, it will be slightly legalistic as, as that is the field that I, I started from. Um, so the arms trade treaty became the first legally binding global instrument to recognize and create obligations around the connection between arms transfers and gender-based violence but that didn't happen overnight and it wasn't easy the negotiations covered a lot of issues and some elements came in and out of the text as it developed we lost victim assistance but gender-based violence remained a constant present throughout the various draft texts by requiring exporting states parties to explicitly consider gender-based violence in export assessments, the ATT created a unique opportunity for states to meaningfully contribute to global efforts to reduce arms-related gender-based violence. And its value as an explicit requirement is partly to reduce the historical tendency to overlook gender-based violence and make consideration of specific mitigation measures that may be required with respect to GBV compared to more visible violations. Gender-based violence is often considered more insidious and less visible than other forms of violence. And that is why a specific focus is required to accurately detect when, where, why, and by whom gender-based violence is being perpetrated. It's a commendable innovation of the ATT by explicitly requiring GBV to be considered in export assessments. It challenges the historical invisibility of gender-based violence and the use of facilitation of arms in its perpetration. So the EU Common Position Review, we thought, offered this straightforward and simple opportunity to update the common position to be in line with the ATT and other obligations. Um, we worked as civil society often does in coalition with many excellent organizations from around Europe coordinated by Safer World in a group we call the Bee Gees. And I looked back through my notes of the presentations we gave at that time and the advocacy routes that we pursued. And what I, what I came back to was that we advocated for some new language that would be um, bringing the risk assessment process into line with the ATT. And we had three reasons for doing so. The first one was that the term internal repression is not recognized under international law. There is no widely accepted definition of what constitutes internal repression. And in addition, it is unclear whether internal repression captures the wide spectrum of serious international human rights law violations recognized under law. And furthermore, referring to serious violations of human rights would create consistency between the EU composition and the ATT. The lack of clarity of that phrase, equipment that might be used for internal repression, was brought into sharp relief um, by member states' export policies to Egypt subsequent to the August 2013 Council conclusion which includes member states also agree to suspend export licenses to Egypt of any equipment that might be used for internal repression. Despite this clear instruction, some member states exported large quantities of small arms and ammunition shortly after, leaving external observers struggling to understand what could be meant by this phrase if it did not apply to these items at that time. The second point we advocated around was that the ATT requires states parties to conduct an assessment of the likelihood of arms exports being used to commit or facilitate serious violations of international human rights law or humanitarian law. The ATT therefore introduces the concept of facilitation, which was not captured by the then formulation of the EU common position. And facilitation is important when talking about reducing GBV. The term facilitate means that the weapons may be one or more steps removed from the actual violation. That is, they may be only an incidental factor 
in the commission of the primary act and may have contributed only to a minor degree, if at all, to the injury suffered. It was intentional in the ATT that a risk assessment of the risk of GBV would not just apply to small arms and light weapons. While battle tanks and armoured combat vehicles may seem unlikely relevant items, we must remember that because of the term facilitate, it will encompass, for example, military officers who use these types of transport vehicles to pick up women and transfer them to detention centres for interrogation accompanied by sexual violence. Vehicles are not being used to di perpetrate directly to perpetrate the sexual violence, but they contribute to its commission. Um, and so before the review and after, there remains no reference to facilitate or facilitation in the common position. There are a number of references in the user guide which seems in part at least to um, design to address the language of the ATT. But the user guide has a lower status. It is not legally binding. And in addition, it makes no effort to um, address what these terms actually mean. Informal discussions with officials from different member states suggest there's no common understanding nor anything approaching one. And this cannot be an appropriate basis for effective implementation. And finally, we advocated that we should lift Article 7.4 from the ATT and put it into the common position, asking um, states to take into account the risk of conventional arms being used to commit or facilitate serious acts of gender-based violence or serious acts of violence against women and children. This obligation was not reflected. So how many of these recommendations were adopted? None. Um, I think, the, the, and I'll, fin I'll finish on this, um, it's a real shame because those pieces of progress made by the ATT are important. They're important on a practical level when we're thinking about day-to-day -day licensing requests. They're important on a political level because it's a political commitment to put this into the legal obligations contained within the composition and not delegate them to the user's guide. Um, we are still struggling within the ATT process to find very good examples of how this imp is implemented. It is not a panacea just to have it there. It's all about how effectively this is implemented. But the ATT is only five years in force. The EU have been working together on this issue and in a cooperative way since the 1990s. So I think more time has passed and there is more opportunity for progress in this area. There will be another review, but states don't have to wait for a review to make progress on their domestic policy and practice. And I think that would be my final takeaway is that we should be advocating for this. We should be asking more states to put this into their domestic export licensing policies and law. And we should not be taking the lower status of the user guide as meaning that the job is done, because from where I sit, it clearly isn't. Thank you, Verity, for this um, very comprehensive overview. Um, and unfortunately, it's such a, a sad overview. But um, I just want to reflect on a couple of points that you've mentioned, because I think they're really, really important. On the one hand, that you've mentioned the work of civil society. And I think it is important when we talk about all of these issues that a lot of the progress that has been made specifically obviously with regard to the arms trade treaty, but also in general, when we talk about women's rights and the rights of LGBTQI, it's driven by civil society. And I think this is also why Georgia was so important in the beginning, you pointed out that the different language and jargons that are being used, it's obviously very hard for civil society to um, influence arms export policies. And I think this is also why it is so important, but it's important to reflect on um, why, why the challenges are so big also. And then, Verity, also thank you for, for pointing out that obviously all types of conventional weapons can facilitate or contribute to gender-based violence. And I think this is very important when we talk about it, because as you said, it, it's, it's often reduced to the discussion about small arms and light weapons. Um, and then lastly, that you've pointed out the facilitation link. And, and I mean, I know from the other work that we're doing together, there's always the tendency from, from governments to focus on the direct link between the arms that is being, or the military equipment that is being exported and the gender-based violence that is being um, contributed to. So, so I think it is important to keep these aspects in mind. Um, 
Hannah Neumann, I would like to turn to you now. And, and sorry, I have to use your last name, but because we have two Hannahs on the call, I want to make sure you know who I'm addressing. Um, you've, the EU Parliament just adopted your, your arms export um, report. It's also called the Hannah Neumann report, I've heard. So congratulations on this. Um, and within the report, you also reflect um, on, on, the, uh, on the update of the EU common position, and you make a very specific suggestion on how the EU could strengthen um, its, its arms export control system, and there would be the harmonization um, of the export policy at an EU level. Um, so, so what is your take on the update of the EU common position, and why do you think the harmonization would be so important uh, to, to avoid human rights violations? Thank you, Nina, for this introduction. And I was carefully listening to Verity, and I'm quite sure the next time I'm either shadow or rapporteur on the arms export report, um, we too need to get in touch with each other and talk. Um, I think, and, and that's why I was ha very happy about this discussion, that um, with the feminism and also the human rights discourse, we often shy away from the hardcore security debates and the hardcore security people refuse to engage with or tend to not understand the human rights and the feminist people. And this is one of the key aspects that, that I wanna work on in the European Parliament, but also beyond, which is why exactly I was a rapporteur for the feminist foreign policy and the arms export um, report to exactly try to see how we can bring these two together. And um, now on the arms export report and why I'm calling for harmonization. Um, I have to say I was equally disappointed about the review of the common um, position as RT has been, um, mainly for the reason that the, it wasn't a proper review. And that's, I think, also why there were, was no room for the inclusion of new elements. It was more like, how can we practice? make some small twitches um, to be better in the practical implementation of the common position. But let me be very clear about the role that the common position plays and can play and should play, because I think this is crucial to understand um, for, for any, any future debate. The common position says in its text that it is legally binding for all EU member states. The problem is de facto it is not. And the common position has actually, if we take away this very specific mentioning of gender-based violence, in all other aspects, the common position is very progressive. So for example, it says arms should not be exported if they, um, are, if they may facilitate a regional escalation or may contribute to regional conflicts, and they may not be um, exported exported if to countries that violate international humanitarian law, they should not be exported if they may be misused for human rights violations or internal repressions. Um, so, so there are eight criteria and they are very progressive and they are very good. And if all member states would implement these eight criteria, we would have a lot less exports and we would have a lot less bigger problem. And then we could, I mean, then we could have a discussion whether gender-based violence would be covered by human rights violations or not. Um, but the problem is, for my understanding, also when it comes to feminist issue and gender-based violence, is not that the term is not in the common position. The problem is that the common position is not applied and it's not legally binding in the sense that no one can take anyone, be it a government or an enterprise or someone, an end user to any court to enforce this kind of legally binding thing. It's the other way around. Basically, we have this common position and all member states signed it. And now it's implemented in 27 member states in 27 very different ways. And some member states have very rigid controls. Um, funny enough, in Belgium, we even have three different systems. So for example, the Flemish are very good. The problem is they don't have very many weapons to export. The French are very lax. The problem is they have very many weapons to export. Um, and that leads to the struggle that although we have this very good common position, it's not properly implemented. That in itself is a bit of a problem and you could say, okay, it's a domestic problem. So we as Germans need to make sure that the Germans um, do it properly and the French should make sure that the French do it properly. But it's no longer the case that just one country produces one kind of weapon. So in nearly every weapon or weapon system that is being used, there are parts from 
two, three, four, five different EU countries. And that's where we are at the moment, because that creates, as you can imagine, a lot of trouble if you have 27 different systems and four countries with four different systems and four different policies um, work together on, let's say, one. Well, we can talk about the Eurofighter because that's where we had the, the biggest debates lately. So France and Germany are producing the Eurofighter. France is, well, Saudi Arabia, we don't mind. We would export it. And Germany says, but we want to have an arms embargo in Saudi Arabia. And it would mean that Germany does not send its components to France because they would know that the French Eurofighter would end up in Saudi. And of course, the French say, but well, that's not how we can do it. I mean, that undermines our way of making our political decisions as the sovereign nation state. And the Germans would say, but well, if you force us to send them to you, that would undermine our way. And you would now say, well, but, but that's good because that means less weapons going out because always one of the four could block it. The problem is that's not how it works. We now see more and more bilateral, multilateral agreements, um, weapon system by weapon system, where um, countries that um, produce uh, components vouch their right to contradict exports. It's, for example, what is in the Aachen Treaty between France and Germany. It's called the de minimis regulation, basically saying if less than 20%, that's what we suggest de minimis means. We don't even know. And I, I mean, I see it in Parliament, so at least I should know. But we are not being told, but we assume it's something like 20% from background talks. Um, as long as these components make up less than 20% of the final product, um, we, we send them anyways, even if our political decisions are different. And that's how we see a very destructive race to the bottom. Because it just means that this is how the companies circumvent even the national rules. We have seen in the past other very, let's say, um, creative ways of circumventing regulations like Rheinmetall, for example. They were producing cannonballs in Italy and the Italian government said, but well, we are not in charge of export decision making because it's a German company and the German BAFA said, well, we are not in charge because they are produced in Italy. And for a number of years until actually it was Greenpeace that kind of stopped it and they could just send them everywhere. And we are seeing this, this creativity of arms industry, not all of them, but a large number trying to find these ways to, 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 to well, I mean, to, to make use of these loopholes to export everything possible. And that's why I think the most important thing is that we harmonize these things, not we harmonize them, but the best way would actually have an EU level arms export control. So like every other good that we have, it's the EU that is in charge of our export. And I think we should come to the same way for the arms, but based on the very strict criteria of the common position. The problem, the three problems that I see at the moment, and that also make feminist work and civil society work very difficult. And that is what I focus on also in my report is the first one is the issue of transparency in public debate. We just know very little about what arms go out. Where do they go? Who is the end user and what are they used for? All this information is there, but it's not being shared and it inhibits all of us to have the public debate that I think is crucial if you want to have any legitimacy behind the idea of exporting arms to other countries outside of the EU. And here also the situation is getting worse and worse right now. And the, the French government, for example, is trying to prevent its parliament of having an after the export has been done report about the exports that have happened. The German government has started in its latest arms export report to blacken out a lot. That's also something we haven't seen before, especially when it comes to Saudi. And that means even if with the common position, and now we have this wonderful tool where you see who exports arms where, as long as the, com the, the countries don't report properly, it's an illusion of transparency, to be frank. And that's something we need to work on. The second one is coherence. That's what I just explained. If all member states have different decisions, it's a total mess. And also we can't have proper accounting and just proper scrutiny and a proper public debate. Because I still strongly believe the more of a public debate we have, the less we will export. And the third aspect is the aspect of political control that I really see undermined at the moment with things like the Aachen Treaty, which basically means if I don't want German spare parts to be in arms exported to Saudi, 
I cannot make that decision in the Bundestag and I cannot make that decision in the European Parliament because the political control over this question has kind of been given up with stuff like the Aachen Treaty and more and more of this is happening. And I really think that is highly problematic. And, but it means also for, for work that people like Verity do, domestic, and you said that you, you're now trying to work more on the national level to get this stuff in. Sadly said, that's the right approach at the moment, given the, I mean, given the, real bindingness of the common position which is which is not there thank you hannah um and thank you for for putting the the question about how we can um um account for gender-based violence in a, in a wider uh, framework of the issues related to arms export policy and in particular obviously i agree so much on, on transparency um, and this is also something that we continuously bring up um, and I, I totally agree with you. I think if there would be a much a, 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 a wider public debate, we would have would have much less arms exports. So, so just let me say that that we're committed um, to to make this um, a public issue over the next years, and uh, we're looking forward to do this uh, together with with you and and others. Um, and um, I just wanted to reflect on on one thing that you've that you've said, um, whether or not gender based violence um, can be accounted for in a human rights uh, violation assessment. And obviously, um, gender-based violence or serious forms of gender-based violence are always human rights violations. There's a lot of um, agreement on this. Um, but I, I just wanted to make, point out that there are also instances where gender-based violence happens where there are no other indicators of human rights violations. We have this, for example, in, in Western Europe, where we have a high rate of femicides, so murders of women um, because they're women, but we have an overall um, a lower rate of, of, of crime or homicides in general. So, so there, is this, there is this added value of why, why we should have a gender sensitive human rights um, assessment. Um, but yeah, obviously you're right, it is a human rights violation. Um, Hannah uh, Muhlenhof, I, I wanna bring in the, the academic pers perspective a bit because you have done, as I said in the beginning, a lot of work on the use approach to so security. And um, in, in one of your articles um, titled, with this wonderful title, the European Union as a masculine military power, European Union security and defense policy. Um, you criticize this increasingly normalization of militarism, which I've also spoken in, in the beginning. Um, and, and what do you mean by this? And, and how is this linked to the EU's arms exports? And in particular about also um, linked to the role of the defense industry and their influence in, in Brussels. Yes, uh, thank you uh, so much really for organizing this event and bringing us all together. Um, I will try to bring a bit more the kind of broader feminist perspective uh, to the table. Um, and this is based on work that I've done with my colleague Marijn Hoytink, I should add, from the FU Amsterdam. Um, and we kind of follow an approach uh, that's based in critical military studies and feminist studies that thinks about militarism in, in a broader way. So we often think when we hear militarism, it's about kind of an ideology, it's about the glorification of war. But actually a lot of scholars have brought forward that this is not necessarily what militar militarism is because often the use of weapons, the use of military instruments is justifies, justified as for instance, a, a means of last resort, uh, something that has to be used, but we don't really want to use it. So it's not usually about the glorification of war um, in that way. So we um, define militarism following this work as anything that prepares the conduct um, of organized political violence. Um, and furthermore, it's about how um, militarism also is, um, appears in our discourses and in our practices. And a lot of, you know, if you think about militarism, of course, a lot of this language is highly gendered um, and which is also partly the reason why uh, we've, as we've discussed, often we also don't have feminists and experts on arms trade coming together uh, because it's uh, there, there, there's of course a highly gendered nature about this this uh, policy field. I can't get more gendered, I think, than that. Um, even though any policy field, of course, is, is gendered, but I think this is an ex extreme case, so to say. Um, so, and this is how we speak about a militarism in the EU. So, obviously, we've always had these discourses about the EU being a soft power, normative power, etc. But we've lately seen these. Um, developments in um, the common security and defense policy 
uh, that there is kind of a move towards more cooperation. It's all, most of it is strictly intergovernmental, um, but we have yeah a variety of initiatives. We have the European Defence Fund. This actually does come from the EU budget, so that's a move uh, towards more integration in that sense. We have the permanent structured cooperation. We have uh, the European peace facility that will probably come. Uh, we have this project of military mobility. There are a lot of kind of um, intergovernmental projects uh, and initiatives in security and defense. Um, and at the same time, we also have a language that is emphasizing this idea of that the EU needs to become a more uh, like a real power, speak the language of power, geopolitical Europe, uh, just to mention a few of these, these quotes. So this is how we identify also an increasing militarism, although we would say it's, it's not completely new. It's been in the making before. Um, and we find that that this um, yeah, increasing militarization, if you want to really call it that, uh, it has to do with two things. And this relates also a bit to your question. Um, and one of them is that it's really about trying to support the European defense industry. Uh, and that is um, yeah, one of the, the goals um, of these all these projects. It's kind of first uh, kind of an internal project about um, also um, yeah, supporting, developing the European defense industry, making it more competitive towards, for instance, the US defense industry. Um, we have seen the establishment of the new DG for defense industry in space, which has exactly this goal. Um, and uh, all, all these things are a lot about really supporting the European defense industry or protecting it, uh, to say it with the language um, of uh, the European External Action Service. Um, but we also think that this is also kind of an exercise in trying to establish, reestablish kind of an identity of the, of the EU. So it also has this external component. So I think when we see more the discourses towards the general public, it's about kind of redefining your own identity as having some sort of relevance, because what could be more relevant than having some sort of military capabilities is obviously still linked very much to ideas of sovereignty and traditional kind of security understandings. So even though the EU doesn't, you know, like using the word sovereignty, uh, only, I mean, it only talks about member state sovereignty, the term strategic autonomy that's being um, become so, <laughs> so important has a lot of also these kind of tones to it. Um, and uh, in this kind of discourse, we also see these ideas that uh, this is about protecting Europe, protecting European citizens, and it's about like, yeah, protecting against threats coming from abroad. And if you come now back to a kind of our, our feminist uh, understanding, we do not see so much that it's about protecting people abroad, let alone about agency for these people. I mean, protection as such is also problematic. Um, so it's, it's very um, focused on, on kind of this othering process. And uh, in a sense, this analysis, I think, also applies to European arms exports. Um, maybe here it's, uh, it's even more relevant in terms of, of the impact of, of uh, uh, arms exports. Um, and even, I mean, Hannah already um, and Verity elaborated on the, the policy uh, steps uh, of the EU in this regard and the lack of harmonization. So we see less willingness to cooperate here than we have seen lately in, in other uh, fields of uh, security and defense. Um, and we also see the lack of the, the language of gender-based violence, which I would also agree it, it is important. But I would also uh, like here to, to caution against, um, in a sense, repeating some of the mistakes that I think, uh, yeah, we've also made when it comes to the implementation of the World Peace and Security Agenda in other contexts. So we shouldn't, you know, try to limit ourselves to adding agenda perspectives to existing frameworks and policies. But I think we should really try to rethink policies more fundamentally. This might also be a question of strategy, but I would like to raise a bit of a critical note here. Um, you know, following a feminist um, yeah, ethics of care and a human-centered security approach, um, I think that such an ethics of care is not really served by regulating arms in that sense. 
And there's also great uh, feminist work on um, uh, the arms trade treaty. And this work raises the question whether this kind of regulation, instead of actually banning uh, arms exports, which of course the goal is to reduce arms exports here, but still creating this regulatory framework might, might also further legitimize arms exports and legitimize what scholars call liberal militarism. So kind of the militarism of liberal democracies. Um, because they create often an idea of what is kind of uh, legitimate arms exports and what is illegitimate arms exports, what is illicit and unregulated trade. And in most cases, this, um, this means that kind of way, yeah, new technologies of warfare are not questioned so much and are not seen as, as this problematic. Whereas we have this focus on small weapons. And if you think obviously about um, the kind of the international relations of this, this reproduces also hierarchies in terms of who's allowed to have weapons, who's allowed to export arms and who is not. Um, and furthermore, um, these treaties do not really, um, and regulations do not really question intra-Western arms exports. So between uh, liberal states. And we do all know that also here, um, if you think about um, human rights um, regulating conditionality, we have to um, question whether um, we really think that uh, is always um, yeah, applied in a fair manner. If you think of the, the um, counter-terrorism, uh, warfare, uh, etc. So I'm just uh, kind of trying to, to formulate a, an idea that if we go down this road of gen gender sensitive arms treaty, we might also lose maybe sight of trying to really rethink or really say clearly that actually we are opposing arms exports as such. And that the goal of demilitarization and, uh, and achieving peace, um, we might lose out of sight because we know how difficult it is with these risk assessments that often kind of uh, come after something has already happened and the weapons are already there. So I will leave it at this um, for now. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for, for making all these uh, very important points and in particular for, for it, um, pointing out how difficult it is also for feminist organizations to engage with this topic. And, and as you've said, and I know um, we work closely um, with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, who obviously also have been instrumental in, in shaping the Arms Trade Treaty. And I think, I mean, they made it very explicit that it's, it's, a, it's a difficult balance, whether or not do you engage in these, in these discussions and do you support these treaties? Um, as you said, but, um, but then risking that you legitimize them, but in the meantime, also acknowledging that we will not have an abolishment of arms exports tomorrow, so we can at least try to make it a less, bit less harmful. So, so I think this is it's, it's a very important balance that you pointed out, and I think there shouldn't be no doubt that a feminist arms trade doesn't exist. A feminist arms trade is a no arms export arms exports at all. So I think this is very um, important that we make make this point. Um, and I and I wanted also to to um, reflect on something that you've said this this division between on the one hand the EU citizens and then the others which I think also in the, in the current EU strategy, it, it's not about, as you said, protecting or supporting them. It's only about the EU citizen. And I think this division between us and them is also, I mean, as you know, it's a very patriarchal one and that obviously legitimizes a lot of the harm that you conflict on the others um, in order to advance whatever your own interest is, whatever you define them. Um, and then also this, this, this notion of um, legitimate arms trade within the Western countries. And I think this is something we in the German context continue to highlight because Germany since um, one year, they do not export any small arms or light weapons or in principle, we do not export small arms and light weapons um, to third countries, but we continue to export them to, to EU, NATO and NATO equivalent countries. But we also do this without um, a proper human rights assessment because we've somehow cleared these countries of any risk assessment. And we are, last year, there were a lot of arms exports to the US, which is highly dangerous for, for women when we talk about um, domestic violence, in particular also femicides. So, so thank you for making all these points. I know we're running late, so I will move on to quickly to the last question, to the next question. Um, Hannah, and I want to stay with you for a second, Mühlenhof. Um, you've already touched upon the Women, Peace and Security agenda. In, in, your, in your articles, 
you've also criticized that the EU is, is making progress on with regard to gender equality and women, peace and security. And I know in particular from civil society, the, the strategic approach adopted in 2018 was celebrated or praised as a significant progress of the EU's understanding to, uh, to women, peace and security and gender equality. But how do you explain yourself that we have that we have this um, militarized approach and then the women, peace and security uh, commitment? Yeah, this is a very, very good question. I would like to hear maybe from Hannah what she thinks, uh, what her insights are. But this is something I've been asking myself. Um, how does this go together? Kind of on the one hand, we have this momentum indeed um, also right now. I mean, also with a lot of the work that Hannah has been doing. Um, and I do think it also has something to do with maybe the moment of the 20 year anniversary of the One Peace and Security Agenda. There is increased visibility. This is more, um, yeah, just on the political agenda. And that also has to do with a lot of good work that's been done by civil society and a lot of efforts, um, yeah, coming from there. So um, that this is a certainly uh, an opportunity. Um, and um, at the same time, we have to wonder how this goes together with this increased focus on or move away from from normative power. I mean, I'm not. I I don't want to idealize normative power here because I I also have criticism there. But um, but still, there there seems to be some sort of a tr transition or shift, at least um, de definitely on the discursive level, but also more and more on the kind of material level or the policy level, um, at least um, in terms of the security and defense policy, and also the general idea that military instruments can be used not only in CCP, but also in other policy fields more broadly, such as development or migration policy. Of course, we should mention that. Um, I, I think that there is something that there is a connection there. I, my, um, like my guess is this is, has to do also um, with kind of the EU's um, kind of trying to reinvent itself, but at the same time also saying, we are still here and we are this liberal force. So I think it's something about reinstating also the use liberal identity in a world where we see backlash against justice um, in terms of gender and sexuality, uh, where we see democratic backsliding, uh, of course, very important debates right now, um, where we see, um, yeah, a lot of this kind of talk about um, uh, real power or traditional power again. So I do think it is a way for the EU to, to reinstate this idea of itself, of kind of this liberal force in the world and that they are kind of on the right side of history. Um, at the same time, here again, I also have a word of caution while I am um, would, un, would I kind of sign to most of the things that, that you've worked on in your report and the idea of a feminist foreign policy, I do also think this can also <laughs> have some risks. Uh, and if we there look at the work of um, actually queer scholars, queer scholarship and post-colonial scholarship, they have kind of worked on um, these questions of how, um, for instance, LGBTQI rights have become a marker of modernity and civilization and how um, Western states and the EU also have um, created this idea of themselves that they are so pro um, LGBTI rights um, and promote these ideas abroad, but also kind of in a way, you know, for teaching others, also reproducing these hierarchies in international relations. And actually, we also know from a lot of work that these categories um, that we have in terms of, for instance, the sexual orientation, gender identity, do not really apply or are relevant in other contexts. And this can also create more harm than good uh, to make um, specific people this visible in other contexts. So this, there is also, I think, a bit of, of a danger there that it shouldn't feminist kind of feminist foreign policy should not be about just creating your own identity and, you know, promoting your own norms and in, in, in a sense also imposing them on others, but we really need to find a dialogue with others. I think 
really there, there needs to be a rethinking of how foreign policy is being done in terms of being doing it in a much more engaged way in a much more dialogical way in a much more you know way to to talk to civil society and then of course we can have a huge discussion what civil society means but um i think there really needs to be a shift and we really need to be careful um that again this this, this idea doesn't get co-opted uh, um in that way thank you um Hannah, do you want to also reflect um, on this, um, yeah, this tension between women, peace, and security, and um, the U.S. arms exports? Yes, please. But it will. I, I was just writing while Hannah was speaking, and it's it's a bit these these kind of contradictions or dichotomies that I think we are currently all struggling with, and and I may just make some of them more explicit, but it's not that I would have a full answer. The first one is, so, I mean, what is with being committed to gender equality and having arms export? First of all, I want to be very clear, it's not EU's arms exports. It's member states of the European Union that export arms. And the other thing is the EU moving towards, or at least in rhetoric, to moving towards like a feminist foreign policy, although it's not we're still discussing on EU level about gender equality because everybody scares away with the F word. I mean, that's how progressive it is. We, the two of us may call it feminist foreign policy and we put in this report and also in the gender action plan as many feminist foreign policy ideas as possible, but we're still talking about gender action plan or gender equality. And for some member states that already is a problem. So let's be very clear on that one. So these are the, the two presumptions in your questions that I just wanted to clarify on. I think, and that's where this window of opportunity for feminist foreign policy is really there, is a frustration with the way foreign policy works or doesn't work at the moment. There is a huge frustration on all levels because we keep banging our heads against the same walls over and over and over again. And we kind of know we are not going to move that way. And for me, the maybe, three most frustrating issues in this regard is the first one, people at the moment can bomb their way to negotiation tables. Latest or best example is maybe Libya where Erdogan had a parliament deciding that he can send an army to Libya and all of a sudden he was um, the deal maker or um, Putin supporting Assad and all of a sudden he is the one deciding over the fate of the Syrian people. And as long as we have a logic where this works, we are not going to get away from the patriarchy, we're not going to get away from this militarization of foreign policy. The second one is foreign policy still being, and Hannah alluded to that a bit, foreign policy still being people with badges talking to people with badges. And that excludes all the others. The bombing your way to the negotiation table in excludes those who have fought for peace and ways for decades from the negotiation tables and people with badges talking to people with badges excludes all these rather not organized movements because we don't know whom to talk to. That's kind of the answer I got with Iraq when all these youth protesters were saying, why don't we engage with them? Well, we wouldn't know whom to talk to. I'm like, well, maybe that's an easy way out, but that's not how we solve problems. Or if you think of the Middle East as Iran versus Saudi, and then we invite the Iranian foreign ministers, then we invite the Saudi foreign minister. But if we look at Iran, well, I mean, the foreign minister may not really represent the place. And as long as we don't manage to, to get beyond this, that is also going to be a problem. And to these issues, I really think feminist foreign policy offers some guidance. But, and that's, Let's go back to the EU. We, I, I see a European Union now that has is continuously adopting a more and more feminist rhetoric or a more and more gender parity equality rhetoric, but we are not where we are not yet walking the talk. If I look at the at at, at the European External Action Service, it is headed by a man. The new Secretary General now that Helga Schmidt left is a man, and all political directors are men. The same is true for DG Defense Industry and Space, or DG Defis. And that's just representation. Um, but th that's where you see the clearest. We are not walking the talk. And we see, on the other hand, um, 
other actors that are just trying to make the EU best fit the old world, the one that I just described is in terms of that's like, how can we have strategic autonomy? How can we make a European defense fund? How can we have these PESCO projects? So it's just making EU fit basically for the old world, whereas the others still struggle with walking the talk on the feminist side. And I mean, there, you will see frictions there, but it's not clear who wins. And on a larger picture, I, I and that's something I struggle myself with, and I can imagine others struggle as well. How do we beat a heavily armed patriarchy? I'm now, I mean, I'm now overstretching it a bit, but how do we beat a heavily armed patriarchy with pacifist feminism? And I sometimes fail to explain that. And, and I mean, that's like an overarching concept, but let's look at Syria the way it is now. Okay, we can say, hey, did we have a feminist foreign policy 20 years ago? Syria wouldn't be the place it is now. But I need to find an answer to the Syria the way it is now. And with a fully pacifist feminism, I'm not sure how far I would get. Although I still think it's the best answer for, for foreign policy as a whole. And, and these are really the, the daily struggles then that, that we are fighting with. And feminist foreign policy sometimes gives some guidance. But I would not say that in the world as it is as of now, it's going to solve everything. And then the last question or the last point I would like to make, um, and that's also why I spoke about Borrell and his cabinet and also spoke about DG Defis. I really think that it makes a big difference of who makes and influences decisions on the output. And now I'm, I'm going back to the issue of arms export. It makes a huge difference if the foreign ministry or the ministry, the industry ministry, or the economics ministry is in charge because it's a different framework with which you look at it. Is it an issue of saving your national industry or is it an issue of foreign policy and human rights? It makes a difference if there's people who have experience from working in the field for the United Nations or if it's people who are running big companies. And if your question is, do we engage or do we need to rethink the whole thing? I can just say, please, please, please engage. Because there's this box of power and making influence and either you claim a third of it or half of it or someone else is going to take it. And the industry is surely willing to take it. Um, thank you, Hannah. And, and um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think the, it's, it's so important that we, that we consider who is making the decision. I mean, that's also a crucial aspect of feminist foreign policy. And then thank you also for outlining the next topics of our webinars. Um, I think you pointed out a lot of good questions and then we'll take it up definitely. Um, I just, before we open up, I wanna go quickly back to Verity for one last question because as Hannah, you just rightly pointed out, it's the EU member states that export the arms. And then we've, in, in Europe, we've seen a lot of gender champions. So we've seen Sweden, the first country to also adopt a feminist foreign policy. We see the UK who has been on the international states stage um, working to prevent sexualized violence and conflict. France is doing a feminist diplomacy. Um, but how does this commitment reflect um, their arms ex on their arms exports? Do they reduce it? Do they work with the ATT? Do they work with civil society to implement the ATT in a gender sensitive way? Verity. <laughs> Nina. Um, I had to think really hard and carefully about my answer to this question because I had a very short, sharp initial reaction, which was apart from Sweden, which doesn't export the types of weapons that we would be looking at in this area. No, they don't. Um, the discrepancy between these policies you've just highlighted and the initiatives and behaviour within the ATT space for some, but not all of those states you mentioned is really stark. Um, Sweden on the positive side played a really important role in facilitating the working group on effective treaty implementation. And in that role, they brought the issue of 7.4 into the conference of states parties process, which meant that diplomatic time and space and energy was given to thought on how do we implement this and what are the questions we should be asking ourselves. The first time they put it on the agenda, they opened it up to the floor. And at that point, there was about 100 states parties to the arms trade treaty. And there was tumbleweed. There was um, civil society speaking. 
and Ireland spoke. And that was it. No other gender champion stood up or asked to take the floor or wanted to talk about how to implement Article 7.4. The next time it came on the agenda, momentum had started to be created, but it was difficult, it was slow, and the opportunity was, was not grasped in the way that countries with these types of initiative you would hope would have done so in that forum. So Latvia then stood up to the plate um, while they were presidents of the Conference of States Party 5 and made gender and gender-based violence the theme of their presidency, which was a brilliant move because it meant that a new paper was able to be tabled, discussions about what were the concrete measures states could be taking around representation, the gendered impact of armed violence and their approach to Article 7.4 had real time in the Conference of States Parties process. But a senior diplomat from one of the states you mentioned from a large exporting country um, basically said, we do not uh, recognize the gendered impact of armed violence. And we thought we'd misheard. So we approached that country and, and spoke to them about it. And we got a really unsatisfactory answer. And I think this speaks to Hannah's point about where decisions are taken and who's involved in processes, because our next step was to talk to the focal gender focal point within that government back in capital. And we did that very quickly, explained what had happened. And you can imagine the disappointment and outrage that came back and then intergovernmental discussion happened and the statement was changed. The issue here is, though, that that damage was done. That was a major exporter saying in a meeting, an international meeting, we do not recognize the gendered impact of armed violence and armed conflict. Even though they took it back at a later stage, it was there. And that sort of issue, if the disarmament diplomats and the gender experts were working together and talking together, you would hope that that would never get to the point where it was made in a public statement. And one of the recommendations that Latvia brought is that in disarmament spaces, gender experts should be part of the delegations that attend these meetings, that work on these processes. And we thought that was a great idea and are striving to have that implemented. Unfortunately, two more slightly negative things, Nina, which I think are, are useful to kind of think about. Um, we had that year, CSP5, where gender, GBV, Article 7.4 was discussed in detail. Papers were produced by the ICRC, Harvard Law School, Control Arms, other civil society organizations, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the Small Arms Survey. Like, there was a lot going on. And the final recommendation in the president's paper that was adopted was that the conference should revisit these recommendations and assess progress on a regular basis. The whole of the next CSP process took place and it wasn't discussed at all. Civil society asked, how are we going to do this? What should we be looking at? Are there indicators we could create? And nothing happened. And we have all of these gender champions in that process. So where is their political capital when it comes to this and how could they spend it better? to ensure that gender isn't just picked up when it's a theme and dropped again straight after. Because unfortunately, that's what we've seen. We've heard encouraging things from the presidency of Sierra Leone that they will find ways to bring that discussion back through, but I'm yet to see what that looks like. And I think the how and the, the, the who is quite important in this. So I know that Control Arms is working hard with the presidency the global coalition to try and ensure that that comes forward again but at the moment it's disappointing and we can't have this event today without mentioning Macron's statement on Monday um, that they will sell arms to Egypt irrespective of human rights yeah I'll leave it there I'll just leave that one hanging yeah thank you so much and um um, we're looking, the hopes are high um, and expectations are high for the next presidency um, of the ATT. Um, now I will, I will um, give the floor to uh, Giorgio, who is now taking questions and we already have one in the chat and we know that, um, and, and also a blue hand. So Giorgio, please take it forward. 
<laughs> thank you. Um, thank you to the panelists for kicking off this wonderful debate. Um, if you want to join the discussion, I would say you have two possibilities. One, if you just uh, raise your hand, that is you move the mouse downwards to participants and then you see the, the list of participants and raise this, the blue hand. And I saw that Margaret Jones already raised her hand and I will call upon her immediately. The other opportunity is you can write a, a question in the chat or in the Q&A box. And I kindly ask Nina to monitor this a little bit with me. I'm an old boy, I'm not very uh, multitasking. So I, I do my best, but I got um, Margaret Jones uh, as first one. And I think you already unmuted her, Nina, right? So Margaret Jones, the floor is yours. If you tell us who you are and eventually also whom you would like to direct your question to, that would be very helpful. I will give then the panelists the opportunity to react at the end of, of um, the, the comment by our participant. Margaret Jones. Wonderful, thank you so, so much uh, for this discussion so far. Um, my name is Margot Jones. I work for the European Peacebuilding Liaison Office in Brussels. Um, and I've been following discussions very closely around the European Peace Facility or EPF uh, for over a year, which Hannah Mullenhoff uh, briefly mentioned earlier. Um, but just in short, the EPF is a new proposed instrument worth 5.5 billion euros, which despite its name would fund assistance to third state armed forces, including uh, the sensitive lethal military equipment and weapons. Um, and I've noticed during my advocacy on this that there weren't organizations with a primary feminist lens doing advocacy on this. Um, but the, obviously the EPF has been mentioned in reports by the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. Uh, and we really appreciate this. And uh, we've been having this conversation today on arms export control. Uh, but I really think that files like the EPF would really benefit from a closer and more sustained feminist look uh, in details. And so, uh, of course, feminist organizations suffer from the problem of being already very stretched across many issues with limited funding, uh, which is a structural issue. Uh, so my question is, um, how do we get more effectively more attention and analysis from feminist organizations and individuals on these less visible and non-gender focused, but also very important files. Um, and I guess this is more of a general question to anybody because uh, it's a question I've been asking myself for over a year. <laughs> so very curious to hear people's thoughts on this. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Margaret. Um, the next question is a question we had in the Q&A box um, submitted by Gocha Bapucci. Excuse me if I, I pronounce it the way I, I, I read it. And the question was, um, it's actually not, uh, it doesn't have a, a, a feminist lens. It's a question about so-called intangible uh, technologies or cyber um, capabilities that the ATT addresses mainly kinetic weapons, so weapons that kill through its kinetic effect. But uh, the question is that there is a growing tendency to have also cyber tools which can be used for military purposes. And the question was by the participant what the EU does about the militarization of cyber capabilities and if they have it on their agenda, on their radar, whoever feels um, um, to, to be able to answer this question is welcome. And then I go back now to the participant list and see the next blue hand, excuse me. Nina, can you help me out? Yes, so we have uh, Jonas Borgmeier. Jonas Borgmeier. You should be able to speak now. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the um, wonderful event. Um, my question regards the arms trade industry. And I was thinking across the lines of um, the climate crisis where we have the fossil fuel industry that now is adapting their business case um, um, to invest into renewable energies. And I was thinking whether there is, whether it's like valid to have um, this approach, thinking that maybe we can find alternative business cases for the arms industry um, to 
incorporate them in this change um, because to me it seems quite unrealistic that within the next five years we could just shut it down but maybe moderate a, a change and set out incentives so I was wondering what you would think um, of, of this thank you so much thank you Jonas and Nina do you see any question in the chat I should mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's one question in the in the chat on um, how it, civil society individuals can pressure their respective governments to make uh, to provide more transparency. Um, and we still have one blue hand. Would you like me to take this, Jojo? Yes. Um, Roy, you should be able to speak now. All right. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, Roy is just uh, from uh, Safer World, um, and I, I found myself uh, kind of nodding through quite a lot of what people were saying and and I'm very sympathetic towards um the uh the frustration Verity felt that there was a year where gender was the the main focus the thematic focus under the arms trade treaty and then it kind of disappears again and yes the Sierra Leone presidency has said that they have an interest in pursuing this but the, the problem that we find so often is that for each presidency they don't want to just pick up somebody else's theme they want their issue that is theirs and that they can point to and say, yes, we did that. And so that is the same for the Sierra Leone presidency of the ATT this year. They've picked up on the issue that they want, which is a very worthy issue, but you know, you've kind of got this like structural problem of how to get an issue like gender to be brought back to the table on a, on a repeated basis. But I, I just um, raised the, 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 the point that um, there is a, a fair likelihood, a good likelihood that Germany will have the presidency for the ATT next year. And so maybe now is the time. No, let's not wait until August or September when, when Germany gets the, post, gets the post. But now is the time to be talking to Germany about um, getting this, putting this issue back on the agenda. And, and Hannah with two H's obviously has a, some pretty strong German connections there and possibly other people on the call. <laughs> other people on the call as well. So maybe there's a there's just a body of work to be done um, uh, starting now to talk to the, the German government about what they're what they're planning for the future. So not a question, just an idea. Thanks very much. Thank you, Roy, and we appreciate you wear a mask in times like this. Very responsible. Uh, in the chat, Mari asks a question to Hannah Mullendorf, but then it's a question you should all, uh, which, which goes to all the panelists, and which is upon um, the post-colonial uh, viewpoints on, on uh, foreign politics. And uh, the question is, how do you, the question is to Hannah Mullendorf, but then to all of Mullendorf, how do you include non-Western, non-white perspectives in your research on arms trade? And to all the panelists, as non-Western, non-white women are strongly affected by gendered armed violence, how does race play into arms trade? All right. Now, I would say I would allow a last question, if there is any. Nina, help me out. I mean, I don't see any hand. I don't see no, anyone in the chat. Yeah. Then I would say we, I, we should give our panelists the opportunity to answer. And I would say um, we start with Verity Cole. Uh, there were several answers uh, and, and uh, excuse me, several questions. Um, just maybe pick the ones you, you find more relevant and then uh, we, we move on to Hannah Neumann. Verity, please. Thank you everyone for such thoughtful questions. Um, <clears throat> I think the first one I'll pick up is around industry. And when I was um, first working on the arms trade, I worked in the UK. And one of the arguments government would give us whenever we said, could we do things differently was, it's a massive trade, it's a massive part of our economy, jobs will be lost, this is really important. And I think that what we've seen over the last few years is a growing desire by civil society to challenge corporate responsibility in this area. And there's a few mechanisms by which we can do that. Um, and one of them is the UN guiding principles on business and looking at the company's responsibility that the products or services that they deploy create no human rights harm. 
Now, if you took that to its fullest meaning, then arms would not be being transferred to most of the places that they are being transferred at the moment. So we have to find ways to, as you suggest, work with business to look at how they can incorporate change. We have talented engineers, we have talented scientists who surely the only thing they can do is not create weapons. So I think it's really inspiring what is going on within the climate movement at the moment. And it is something that civil society can pay, pay closer attention to when it comes to their arms industry. Um, the other questions, I think um, if, I, if I catch you right about cyber tools, then we, there are different mechanisms and processes going on that are looking to, um, again, regulate, I'm afraid, Hannah, but different trades in, say, the equipment used for torture. So at the moment, a group of governmental experts is forming at the UN to try and replicate and build on the work that the EU has done to prohibit certain equipment that only has um, the effect of torture and ill treatment and regulate others that when misused, which happens often, um, will relate in torture and inhumane treatment. On autonomous weapon systems, there is work going on there as well. Cyber is not my area of expertise, so I might not have answered your question right. But I think in, in answer to all of the challenges posed by various types of weaponry or various types of harm that can be caused, a human rights lens, a feminist lens, is only going to improve the way that we tackle these big problems. I'll leave it there, Georgia. Thanks. Thank you, Verity. Uh, since I know that Hannah Neumann has to leave us at um, 2.30 sharp, I would say you're the next one who can take the floor and answer any question you want. There were a few which were pretty much directed to the EU. So like, for example, the cyber question, what, was, what does the EU do with the so-called intangible transfers or not the non-kinetic transfers of, of arms or dual use goods? And are you up for the challenge? And there was some further stuff. Hannah, please. Thanks, Jojo. Um, and I, I just did the round. Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks, Roy, for your, as always, very sharp analysis and um, po pointing the fingers at the Germans, which is fairly deserved. And um, we will see which government will then be in charge. Um, this may hamper a bit the, the let's say, a strategical approach of uh, the German government because we are having elections in September. But maybe my ties may then even be closer to those um, running the show in the foreign ministry. Let's see. But I think what is very important, and I know Roy is working on it, but I want to leave this note to everyone else. This issue becomes more and more one at least discussed at the European level. So linking civil society on the European level to push there is very important because the defense industry is doing that for something like five years already now. One of the outcome is that we now have a DG defense industry and space. And I really think civil society also needs to engage stronger together on the European level, but also decentralized in the nation states, but based on the common strategy. And that's how I think we will all be very much stronger. There is maybe coming a bit of us from the Greens in the European Parliament also towards civil society next year. Um, but I really think we need to work on this together. Jonas, quickly. Um, can we basically have a transition for the arms industry people into something nicer? The problem is we, we have two competing logics. Yours is how can we quickly make sure that there are no more arms produced in the European Union? The problem is the majority of uh, citizens in the European Union and also in Germany still think that we need weapons to defend ourselves. And the issue of arms export is then one about to, in what quantities can we produce these weapons to make them cheaper for us. And that's a totally different logic. And I'm afraid we are not yet um, on your path of just trying to make sure um, and the Germans or anyone else is not going to produce any more weapons at all. So I think, I mean, theoretically, technically, economically, it is feasible, but the political will for, for this path is not, not there at the moment. On cyber, um, well, I, it, it is largely still, again, a member states issue. Um, the European Union is working on a cyber strategy as um, uh, starting to work on a cyber strategy. I'm not an expert in that one. I have to clearly say that. 
but engaging there in that strategy would, would surely make a lot of sense. There has been a lot of work on dual use, Georgia, you just mentioned it, and their dual use directive is going to come to an end, I think January or February. Um, to what extent feminists have been involved in that, I, I have to say, I don't know. And that's why my last question is the one on the European Peace Facility, because on that, again, I know a lot, to <laughs> make me look better in the end. Um, Margot, you're right, it's a 5.5 billion program, but um, we also need to be very transparent in how we communicated these 5.5 billions are not all meant for the equip component. It's a very small part of this 5.5 billion that are for the equip component. Nevertheless, the European Peace Facility is a huge headache for us because by the way it, is put, it, it, it works, it kind of escapes parliamentary scrutiny and transparency again, because it's not an EU budget program for which the European Parliament could claim oversight, but it's EU member states putting money into one pot and then telling the European Parliament it's not your money, you can't say anything, but also often um, while escaping scrutiny on national level because it's that, that European fund, fund thing. Um, and at the moment there's a huge debate between member states because this equipped component has not been agreed upon on safeguards, risk assessment, the process of actual exports and end user control because we have these 27 different systems, but not an EU system. And I'm trying to get information on that. It's very difficult. Yesterday, for example, in a secret meeting, I was assured that these safeguards are tremendous. And then I said, yeah, can I please see them and make my own assessment because that's my role. Um, and then everybody was very silent. Um, so there really, I think it is very important um, that we work together also when it's there, but even now in the setup phase, and I would say to strengthen those governments who are very critical towards the peace facility. And I know Netherlands, for example, is one, Sweden is one. Um, and I mean, just make sure that they know that we are watching them. Thank you, Hannah Neumann. And now we go to Hannah Mühlendorf. And there was a question which uh, basically said there in the, in the arms trade issue, we don't only have a blind spot with respect to feminism, but maybe even with respect to one, with respect to colonial or post-colonial perspectives, non-white perspectives. And the question Hannah Mullendorf was directed to you, how you integrate these maybe potential blind spots, post-colonialism and non-white perspectives in your research on arms transfers and um, arms trade. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, let me start with that, with that question. Um, I think it's a very relevant question. There is a lot of discussion also now, finally, on how we can decolonize also our study of Europe or our study of international relations. Um, and I think um, that we definitely race plays a role uh, because I do think there are these, as I mentioned before, ideas created of who can have weapons, who is legit, you know, who is a legitimate actor to to use weapons because supposedly they use weapons in a responsible manner, um, et cetera, et cetera. So th there is race plays a role and, um, uh, and ideas um, that have colonial legacies play a role, um, certainly. How to do this? I mean, I work a lot also with the literature on women, peace and security that I think should maybe probably deal even more with these questions of arms exports. But there is also a lot of literature there coming from the global south that actually has different perspectives also on women peace and security which has to do also with the fact that in the global north we understand women peace and security to be part of our foreign policy whereas in the global uh, south women peace and security is usually also a domestic policy which i think is something that also um, western countries should consider uh, doing um, but there there's much more questions about how foreign policy also affects the domestic um, and there are different um, perspectives there. And I think um, what is also necessary um, as a next step, and I think this, this research is missing when it comes to EU secure and defense policy, uh, to some extent at least, is more often, uh, yeah, more field work actually in, in the context where uh, these policies take effect um, to work um, more with civil society there on, the, on these questions. And there again, also, I think there's already quite some work in, in the women, peace and security studies to share not specifically on, on the EU, however. Um, I would also like to, to say something about the, um, 
the European Peace Facility because actually this is something I'm uh, also trying to work on and I've also found it extremely difficult to get information on what's going on. So that was insightful uh, to hear um, already. So, and I, I think um, this is something we need to closely watch. And I think um, Margaret Jones, you were also asking where are like the, the women's uh, rights organizations there? I, I just have a bit of a, a uh, a guess uh, in that sense, because my impression is that very often, obviously, the the peace uh, development organizations they are much more, you know, they have much more influence, they're just much bigger, um, and they are also maybe more focused um, on these questions. And for women's organizations, it's often quite, um, yeah, quite difficult uh, to get access to these these kinds of. Um, policy fields. And we even see this within the women, peace and security agenda in certain contexts where it's more the established NGOs, peace and development NGOs that are more involved than actually women's organizations because they're often, often smaller um, and have less resources. So that, that's just one uh, guess um, here. But I do think that we, we, the European peace facility is a very important thing we, we need to um, observe and ask questions about. I found the point by by Jonas very interesting, and I uh, I think I agree also with with what um, Hannah Neumann said. It doesn't really seem like there's an opportunity there. I was thinking about the current pandemic as a window of opportunity in the beginning of the pandemic, but when we um, actually you could think this could be a moment to transform uh, security policies to some extent. Um, you could think, you know, we see we need to redirect resources into other fields uh, to provide rather health security, for instance. But it's, and I mean, I think the pandemic is also the reason why we have now a bit less funding in, in security and defense, um, these initiatives. But at the same time, there is an attempt to really try to still make the point that actually in the pandemic, we see that we need the militaries because they have done such a good job in terms of, you know, oh, logistics. Oh, sorry, I come down. Obviously, and uh, so there is actually when you when you look at uh, what Borel has been saying, very much uh, they're trying to make use of of the pandemic to say now we really need to do something about security. Um, so I think this is also something we need to push back against. We need to actually say something about how this moment shows us we need to invest in other in other areas. Thank you, Hannah. We are running out of time. And I think um, we got a very good overview on uh, the situation um, of arms exports in Europe and that it should improve. Now, <clears throat> since we still have three minutes, I would like to ask a very quick question to the three of you. Uh, Christmas is coming close. Maybe some of you believe in Santa Claus or Santa Claudia. If you have one wish uh, on how the situation of arms trade could be improved in Europe, what would it be? Like one sentence, I would wish that dear Santa Claus, Santa Claudia, uh, this should be done so that in 2021, we have a better arms export policy in Europe. Hannah Neumann, what, what would be your wish for Christmas, if you believe Fully in Fully transparent, comparable reporting on usable indicators. Because I really have full trust that once we have a proper debate about this, there will be less arms exports. Thank you. Verity Coyle. I wish, dear Santa, that there were no more arms exports where they're going to be used to commit human rights abuses. Thank you. And Hannah Mühlendorf, your wish? I'm not sure, but it has to be a realistic wish. But since it's a Christmas wish, I guess it doesn't have to be realistic. I mean, I would like an end to all, to all arms exports uh, and the demilitarization of security policies. Thank you, Hannah Mühlendorf. Thank you, Hannah Neumann. Thank you, Verity Coyle. And on this very hopeful note to ending all arms exports, I give back to Nina uh, to, for a final farewell. And uh, thank you all for this inspiring discussion. Nina. Thank you, Giorgio. Um, there's actually not much I want to add um, from, from my side. Just thank you so much to our panelists. I think it was a very, very interesting and also insightful discussion. Um, and, and thank you for all the particip participants for joining us and, and for your questions. And 
Um, I can just speak for CFFP, but we will continue uh, to, to put this agenda on, on um, the topic on the agenda and obviously in cooperation with any of you if you wish to do so. So um, have a good day. And then um, if you celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas um, and a good uh, start in the new year. Thank Bye. You. <laughs>